an exciting moment. This takes us back 15 years from the beginning and takes us into the next 15 years. So here you're standing on the location of where the Marilyn Schuler Classroom for Human Rights will be built. time today. Uh, today's a very special day. My name is Sarah Woodley. I am the current president of the board of directors of the Wasma Center for Human Rights, home of the Idaho and Frank Human Rights Memorial, and I am honored to be the master of ceremonies um, today for the celebration of our 15th anniversary. Yeah. <laughs> Woohoo! and the groundbreaking for the Marilyn Schuler Classroom for Human Rights. We've had some wonderful donations from Tate's Rents, Porta Pros, Allied Waste, Boise City Parks and Rec has been so helpful, and John Wasson with ACHD. We couldn't have made all this happen without you. Um, and finally, I wanna thank the event committee. They've been working hard on this for almost a year now. Thanks very much. Almost 20 years ago, a passionate group of people wanted to show the world that Idaho wasn't just the white supremacist groups we were becoming known for on a national level. They shouted, Idaho's more than that. And they rallied support across the state to share that message. 15 years ago today, their efforts culminated in this wonderful, wonderful memorial and an education center that we have here to share the story of Anne Frank, to teach us about the universally declared human rights, and to remind us of the strong individuals who fought for human rights for over 100 years. I'm so pleased to see some of those founding folks in the audience today. Thank you for all you've done. Now today, yes. This week, we've seen another story, national story, that puts Idaho in the news again. By some measures, we are being called the second most hateful state in the nation. We're a generation removed from the memorial founders, and fear and hate is spreading again. In that article, they count 12 hate groups, including five new anti-Muslim groups that weren't here just two years ago and they count the low numbers of racially and ethnically diverse citizens we have in our state. But today I wanna to count some other things. I wanna count the 250 people a day that come through the memorial. I wanna count the number of docents that volunteer their time to lead groups through the memorial. We can count 10,000 people each year that take these tours. Let's count the hundreds of classrooms who discuss human rights and then have students participate in our poetry and our art contests each year. And let's count this, the times that our citizens have been inspired by the message of the center to be an upstander for someone who's being bullied or oppressed. Let's count the good in our state. So today we're going to dance and sing, we're going to reflect on our past and dream about our future, and I hope that you with me will share gratitude for being able to be counted as among those Idahoans who stand up for human rights. Thank you. At this time, I would like to welcome Governor Phil Batt to the stage. Um, Philip E. Batt is a longtime Idaho leader who spent his entire career and devoted much of his personal time in service to others. Wars are always hell. World War II was among the worst. It devastated my family and tens of thousands of others. The destruction of Pearl Harbor 
caused us to spend a major part of our national effort to defeat the Japanese. We also stormed Normandy, along with France and Great Britain and other allies, and we were instrumental in retrieving Europe and chasing the despicable Nazis into total surrender. Our suffering was nothing compared to the European Jews who were systematically slaughtered in concentration camps and elsewhere. And Frank's ordeal and the narration of her story gives us an opportunity to reflect and to see the devastating effect suffered by all people from racial, sexual, and other trampling on human rights in our lives. This never makes any sense. Nobody gains from discrimination. Marilyn Schuler has been our unquestioned, unquestioned champion for human rights in Idaho. I had the privilege of working with her when we succeeded in placing in our code the first human rights law in, law in Idaho. I, elected, I was elected to the uh, Idaho House of Representatives in 1965, and we had a major reapportionment immediately after that. A lot of Senate seats opened up, and in Canyon County there were three unopposed. I ran for a Senate seat, no, no opposition. That was great. <laughs> but when I, uh, when I was in the Senate, I didn't have any particular things to concentrate on, so I, I wanted to pick on the fact we didn't have, have a human rights law in Idaho. I had 20 or 30 hearings on my own, just unofficial things, and we shaped the human rights law, and along with Maryland, of course. The next year, we realized that we hadn't done much about women's rights, and we passed plan, plan, a comprehensive human rights or uh, women's rights law in the United State. I regret to report that we have been unsuccessful in adding the words of, of outlawing discrimination based on sexual orientation. Marilyn and I gave it our best efforts on several occasions. Many Idaho lawmakers preferred to protect their own biases, though federal law prevails. Marilyn had plenty of courage, but many times she relied, relied more on her unmatched powers of persuasion. At times, however, she gave it all she had. For instance, in the North, uh, North Idaho problem with the Nazis, she got in a lawsuit and uh, we chased those horrible pieces of people out of here. According, according to the news reports, I don't, I didn't think much of her, uh, that report. I don't think her, Idaho is a leading a nation in discriminating against people. We've got some problems, all right. Just because we're 90 some percent white doesn't mean we can't be sympathetic and leaning in discrimination of all kinds. She was our great champion of human rights. We owe her the honor she has earned in our state, and I'm grateful that we are recognizing that story today. Thank you. Sanders served as governor of Idaho for 14 years from 1971 to 1977 and again from 1987 to 1995. He was the United States Secretary of the Interior under President Carter. <laughs> governor Andrus is noted for his strong conservationist and environmental views and accomplishments and for his profound dedication to public service. He has a strong dedication to human rights. While he was governor 
Um, he was governor for part of the time that Marilyn Schuler was the director of Idaho Human of the Idaho Human Rights Commission, along with Governor Batt. Um, and today we'll hear from Governor Andrus's daughter Tracy, who offers words from her father. Uh, please join me in welcoming Tracy Andrus. Dad asked me to convey his sincere regrets today that he can't be here with you to honor a person whose work he has admired for decades. Unfortunately, his own health has given him some challenges of late, but we're hopeful that his iron will and determined spirit will once again serve him well. This wonderful classroom for human rights that will incorporate Marilyn Schuler's name and spirit and the unwavering belief she held in the importance of practicing human kindness and understanding in our interactions with all our fellow beings. Marilyn, her kind eyes, her warm smile, and that steely determination embodied so many of the qualities that we wish this turbulent world would spend more time embracing. Dad's teamwork with Marilyn began nearly 50 years ago when they recognized the need for state-sponsored kindergartens. It took them five years and a whole lot of arm twisting, as only Marilyn and Dad could do. I mean, who could say no to them? Uh, although, truth be told, I think it was a lot easier to say no to Dad than it was to Marilyn. <laughs> Finally, in 1975, they successfully shepherded legislation through the State House that established voluntary state-sponsored kindergartens in Idaho. And to this day, the state's program remains voluntary, but with 93% of Idaho's children participating. Marilyn also worked with Dad to create an official Human Rights Day in Idaho that would honor, among other human rights activities, the life and work of Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. It is unfortunate that in Idaho at that point in time, it was not an easy lift to make that day of remembrance happen, as we were one of the last to do so. Nonetheless, Marilyn was not to be deterred. And today we officially recognize Human Rights Day each third Monday in January. Once again, Idaho owes Marilyn a debt of gratitude. Dad called Marilyn a determined champion for human rights and basic decency. At her passing, he said Marilyn Schuler was our moral compass in the ongoing fight to ensure that all people are treated with respect, dignity, compassion, and as the law and constitution demand. With this wonderful classroom you dedicate here today, the life and work of a remarkable woman we all loved, admired, and miss greatly, will live on and enrich the lives of countless generations to follow. Thank you for being here and thank you for supporting this important classroom. Marilyn Schuler's son David lives with his family in New York. Marilyn's son, Tom, is a corporal with the Boise Police Department, who can sometimes be seen patrolling on his bike down around here. Uh, he also serves as a colonel with the Idaho Air National Guard at Gowan Field, and he's currently serving active duty in northern Iraq. Yeah. The family has asked that Marsha Franklin speak on their behalf this afternoon. Marsha is a familiar face in Idaho households, having been a presence on Idaho news media since the 1990. She's a producer and host at Idaho Public Television. And Marsha was like a daughter to Marilyn and interviewed Marilyn several times about significance of events involving human rights in our state. 
I'm pleased to introduce Marsha Franklin to represent the Schuler family here at our groundbreaking for the Marilyn Schuler Outdoor Classroom. Thank you so much, Sarah. Wow, this is a beautiful day, isn't it? Just as it was 15 years ago, it was also a beautiful day for a number of reasons. I'm really, really honored to be here, and I'm certainly honored to follow Governor Batt and Tracy Andrus on behalf of Governor Andrus. Both men reflected the values that Maryland stood for. But I certainly wish that I were in the audience instead, looking up at Maryland, talking. It's been six months since he died, a little bit over six months. And I know all of you who knew Marilyn um, joined me in missing her greatly. By the way, isn't this a fabulous photo of Marilyn? I had never seen it before and I thought I'd seen every photo of Marilyn and it, it so captures her spirit. I actually have another photo of Marilyn speaking at this very spot sometime early in the history of the Anne Frank Memorial, she was wearing a dress in one of her favorite colors, coral. So in her honor, I'm wearing one of her scarves in that color as well. There's another tie for me between coral and Maryland. Coral reefs support incredible biodiversity in our oceans, just as Maryland supported all kinds of diversity herself. Coral grows in colonies and relies on attaching itself to structures like rocks. And most corals get their energy from organisms that live inside themselves. Because of these examples of symbiosis, in the spiritual world, world the color coral is often seen as representative of a whole community and of interdependence. Indeed, some holy people and mystics wear coral robes as a symbol of their quest to subsume their egos to the whole. Marilyn certainly exemplified that, although with her wry humor, she'd be the first to tell you she was hardly a saint. But she's not here, so we can sanctify her today. As mentioned, I'm here representing Marilyn's family. Her son, Tom, a Boise police officer who would have liked to have been here, is serving a six-month tour of duty as a colonel for the Idaho Air National Guard in Iraqi Kurdistan, where he's helping run one of our military bases there. David, who works in finance in New York, was actually just in Boise and also regrets missing this ceremony. Both men were raised by two loving parents committed to their own children and to those of others. If Marilyn were here today, I know she'd speak about her admiration for her husband, John, a devoted social worker for the Idaho Department of Health and Welfare and a foster parent alongside Marilyn. To the day she died, Marilyn felt John didn't get the credit he deserved for all he had done for children. As some of you know, she endowed a fund in his honor at the Department of Health and Welfare that helps foster kids buy small things, a piece of clothing, some music lessons, some ice skates that will lift their burden just a bit. Marilyn carried John with her in all she did. So if people end up shortening the name of this to the Schuler classroom, that would be just fine with her. Indeed, if Marilyn were alive, she would likely have pushed back on the idea that this should be named for her. So intent was she on shining the limelight on others. She would have demurred, wanting this honor to be shared with all who worked so hard to get the memorial and center started, including Lisa Allman, Nancy Taylor, Sidney Fiddler, Leslie Drake, Kathy Yamamoto, Alan Terrell, and of course, Greg Carr, who supported it so strongly with his financial contributions. Several of those individuals are here today. Thank you very much. But I think even Marilyn might have been coerced in her lifetime to accept this honor because education was so important to her. From being the youngest ever chair of the Boise School Board to her efforts at bringing kindergartens to the state to her ongoing support of student scholarships at the City Club, nothing was more important to her than education. One of my favorite photos of Marilyn is of her on stage in a wheelchair speaking to hundreds of school children at North Idaho College. She's at the annual Martin Luther King Jr. Day event for fifth graders in the Coeur d'Alene and Post Falls School Districts, sponsored by the Kootenai County Human Rights Task Force. Her eyes and body are filled with energy and joy. I wish she could be alive to talk to the children who will visit here. Speaking of visiting, I remember visiting Marilyn when the Anne Frank Memorial was still in the planning stages. There was a binder on her table with all the quotes that she and the other organizers wanted on the walls. 
It seemed there was a quote that represented almost every aspect of human rights. I couldn't imagine how even a fraction of them would make it, but many of them did. You see, if even one quote could reach a person and educate him or her, that was what Marilyn wanted. She would be delighted to know that new quotes will be added to this area. <laughs> Marilyn had great admiration for longtime docents like Don and Susan Curtis, who tirelessly explained those quotes and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights to students and for Rose Beale, who also gave so much of her time here to talk to young people about the difficult subject of the Holocaust. The Curtises unfortunately couldn't be here today, and Rose passed away in 2014. But Rose's son, Danny, is here providing us with some beautiful music. So thank you, Danny. <laughs> Marilyn would have appreciated that the classroom area will have additional information on the human rights challenges our state has faced and continues to face. She spoke often, for instance, about the human rights violations perpetrated on Chinese minors in Idaho, as well as the tragedy of the Japanese internment center in Minidoka, and the lack of human rights protections for those in the LGBT community. Visitors will also be able to learn more about Maryland at one of the kiosks planned for the area, which is wonderful. Some of those kiosks will have video from a documentary I produced that she was in called The Color of Conscience, about the fight against the Aryan nations the hate group that called Idaho home for more than 20 years. On September 7th, 2000, the anniversary of which is coming up, a jury in Coeur d'Alene found the leader of the Aryan Nations, Richard Butler, and one of his associates negligent in a shooting. The $6.3 million judgment against them would bankrupt the group. As we stand here nearly 17 years later, we're all acutely aware of a rise again in neo-Nazism and white supremacy. If she were speaking, Marilyn would not ignore this issue, as Governor Batt did not either. She would speak out against it. But while she would have been aghast and sad by what has been occurring, she would not have been surprised. We have been here before. She would tell us to speak up. And she would likely point to the efforts of brave people like Bill Wasmuth. Bill's house was bombed during the height of the fight against the Aryan Nations. He kept going. Leaders like Tony Stewart of the Kootenai County Human Rights Task Force came up with the creative idea of raising money for human rights groups for every minute the marchers were on the street from the Aryan Nations. The longer you walk, he told Butler, the more money we get. I believe the task force ended up with more than $30,000 when the Aryan Nations marched in Coeur d'Alene uh, for half an hour. Maybe that should be tried again. When I interviewed her for the Color of Conscience, Maryland warned that the challenges were not over just because the Aryan Nations was gone from the state. If we think that just because we knocked out the tip of the iceberg that we've done our duty and that bias is no longer in Idaho, she said, we're dead wrong. All of us, Marilyn said, need to keep working on issues of human rights, starting with talking to our children. We need to socialize children so that they will feel connectedness to people that are not in their group and realize that they have a bond with them, that we're all human, she said. As I prepared this talk, an early memory came back to me related to that. I was no more than seven when a little girl came up to me and started putting her hands through my hair and pressing on my head. When I asked her what she was doing, she said, you're Jewish, right? Yeah, I said. Well, she said, you have horns. I wanted to feel them. I supposedly also had hooves, according to her. It was certainly one of the first times I realized that not all children learn the same thing at home. Marilyn felt the scourge of bullying constantly as a child stricken with polio. She had been a popular girl before she got the disease, but once she became sick, she told me in an interview, I became an immediate social isolate. I just didn't have any friends, she said. I remember once falling down and the teacher didn't even try to help me back up. I think the teachers were afraid of us too. It was just absolutely horrible. Anything that can be done in this setting to educate against that type of dehumanization will honor Marilyn, both what she experienced as a person with a disability and what she fought against on behalf of others. 
A lifelong learner herself, Marilyn would also contend that that education should also include learning about why some people are afraid of others. We can't counter what we don't understand. Marilyn believed not only in education, but also in advocacy. She attended many rallies here and was strong in her belief that the center should speak up for those who are marginalized. So she would be happy to know that her classroom will also be used as a convening space for groups. When we filmed her with Bill Wasmith, Idaho Purse, and Norm Gissel on the Aryan Nations compound before it was destroyed, Marilyn was drawn to the printed material that still littered the buildings, pamphlets that educated through hate and fear and showed blacks and Jews as subhuman. She knew that the power of education could be subverted this way and that it needed to be countered with a different kind of education, one that will happen here. That would please her very much, as it would please Bill. As Bill told me, for the real change to happen, that needs to take place community by community and person by person. It's the hearts of people that need to move forward. That thought is so well encapsulated by the quote that's been chosen for the floor of the Schuler classroom. Educating the mind without educating the heart is no education at all. Marilyn loved Bill, and for many years they were a team. So it is fitting that their names and legacies are now honored side by side. I miss her every single day, and I know I'm not alone. This new space will provide me and others who loved her with a place to remember Marilyn. In a way, she will live on. As her son David wrote me, the educational pavilion is in many ways a perfect tribute to her and to the values she worked for throughout her life. And I would add, it's high time. On behalf of the Schuler family, thank you. The Wasmuth Center hosts an annual poetry contest, open to all grades six through 12, um, all, all six through 12 students in Idaho. The contest is held in honor of Wilma Landman Loeb, mother of Pauline Harf, a longtime supporter of the Wasmuth Center. This year's winner is Alex Swerdloff, who is a student at Boise High School, go Braves, and also a member of Boise's Reform Synagogue. Reflecting upon the human spirit and the will to survive, Alex will read her winning entry from this year's poetry contest. Uh, this poem is called The Caged Bird. Oops. One. I remember learning to play the piano, the wonder with which my tiny fingers balanced on polished keys, reaching, reaching, tiny feet to distant pedals, the full cry of the lower register, the trills of the highest notes, the delight of sliding my fingers into place year after year, feeling the spots where my hands had worn a home here. The Warsaw of my childhood was full of music, street corner buskers, buttoned up conductors, canters and songbooks at the synagogue, and my father's favorite records, Put on after dinner the tune to our kitchen dance. The records would be the first to go. Too incriminating, my father would explain as he lit a fire in the backyard. They're foreign artists, they're Jewish composers. Together we watched the music of my childhood bubble and burn and rise, smoke into an unforgiving sky. First the records, then the music books, then the piano itself. The buskers replaced by soldiers at each corner. The drumbeat of boots on concrete. And then, finally, us. Two. There was no music at Sobibor. At least, not the kind I was used to. No cascading chords of piano. No swells of self-important cello. None of that. Sobibor was a place of silence. Of long, skinny silence, as bone-thin and desperate as its captives. It took time for me to hear its music. The rhythm of our breath, our sighs, a hopeful drumbeat in our footsteps. A high sea whistled on the wind, rising with the smoke. And sometimes, on a good day, when the work didn't seem as hard, the cold not so biting, I could have sworn I heard piano. The center's mission is to promote respect for human dignity and diversity through education. Our goal is to reach every student in the state of Idaho sometime during their educational career through our programming and resources. That would not be possible without the commitment of educators throughout the state. Joining us today is David Maxwell, English teacher at St. Joseph's Catholic School in Boise. 
Um, being an English teacher, I always try to get my kids to find their voice and share their experiences through writing. So I inspire kids who are just willing to, you know, stand up in front of an audience. I, I get nervous standing up in front of an audience. So to have kids be able to do that and, and share their voice and, and how they feel is an amazing thing. Um, I, I'm just honored to be here today to be able to speak. They, they told me to keep it at five minutes, so I'll try or something like that. Um, I, I speak for a living, I guess you can say, in front of kids. So. I tend to speak for an hour straight, and the kids are like, so do we have homework? <laughs> you didn't, I said that in there. Um, but my experience, you know, just here with the center has been very uplifting just in the past couple months, I would say. I mean, my first, uh, I guess I could say my first recognition of the word upstandard was probably about th two years ago now when I first visited not walked through, but when I actually first visited the memorial here and actually came with my classroom and, um, you know, the docents here spoke to our kids about being an upstander and I, and I had heard the word but never really used it and I never expressed it. You know, I said the word bystander a lot, right? Oh, I'm just an innocent bystander and I felt like, you know, being a bystander, I've probably gotten more trouble than, you know, if I would have said something, you know, and, and been an upstander. So, you know, uh, just hearing that and and um, how they shared that with the kids, um, you know, made me go back to my classroom and go, all right, next year I'm gonna teach the Diary of Anne Frank. That's what I'm gonna put that in my unit. Um, and then I took a class this summer, The Spiral of Injustice Through the Center, and, and sitting in that class for three days, I realized I can't just read the Diary of Anne Frank, I can't just teach this book, but I have to use this book to educate the kids on how she could still, you know, have her voice through this experience, and also maybe if someone would have done something a little bit sooner and spoke up, you know, she would have been able to live a little bit longer. Um, and and then we look at our society today, and and um, you know we don't have a lot of upstanders. We have a lot of bystanders who stand around and kind of let things happen because it's not happening to me. And then those people who you know are influenced or involved, you know, their voices get taken away. Um, and that's why I love writing because you know once you put it down, it's there. Um, and it can be shared, and, and, and thankfully Anne did that, and she shared her experience, and we are still able to read that today. So instead of going back and creating this unit to teach the Diary of Anne Frank, I said, I'm going to use pieces of this novel to teach my kids how to become upstanders and how to stand up for themselves. Um, I've been in situations myself where no one stood up for me, and, and, and it was very hard to fight that fight by yourself. It was really hard to, you know, know you're doing the right thing, but you have multiple other people telling you, or, or at least assuming that you're not. And, and when you're standing on that island alone, it's very easy to kind of turn your back and walk off of it and drown, you know? And, and that happened to me a couple times. And just recently I had an experience that I don't, don't want to dive too much into, but, you know, I had some fellow teachers and fellow educators who knew that I was doing the right thing and they stood up for me and that was a completely different experience. I was able to be a stronger person and, and speak my mind and voice my opinion through the experience and continue to stand up and not doubt myself and say, yes, I am doing the right thing because others are actually seeing that. And, and um, that also made me go into the mindset of I have to share this with my kids and share these experiences with them. And, and let them know that it's okay to have a voice and stand up for what you believe in, especially if you feel you're, you're doing the right thing. And, and of course, some people sometimes feel they're doing the right thing and we have to let them know they're not doing the right thing. But, <laughs> but you know, you don't know that until you're educated, right? And this is great that we are open in this classroom, we're open in this establishment. I mean, I'm, I'm just floored that I was able to come here with my classroom, take a class here for three days, walk away with not only knowledge, but the resources to go back to my classroom and teach this. And then it followed up with another class I took at BSU where we, the first day came back here and read all the quotes on the wall. And, and I just knew that that happened all for a reason. And I was meant to, to um, you know, teach my kids how to, how to have a voice and how to be strong and, and not be silent, especially in the boundaries of a, of the school because there are bullies in the school and, and, and there may be one or two, but they control the school and the kids feel, you know, I, I'm not going to say anything. They're not messing with me. And, and the next thing you know, those bullies rope in other people who aren't bullying, but yet not stopping them from bullying. So therefore, 
they, they kind of just allow them to get away with it. And, and we have to have one person, one kid say, this isn't right. You, you can't do this. And that lends to the next person to say, you know what, you're, you're right, this isn't right, and, and so forth. But we have to have kids to feel strong and feel that they have a voice to do that. So like my central question this year starting out is, to what extent do you feel you have a voice here at our school? Regardless if it's in the classroom, out on the playground, you know, just in the rules maybe, right? I mean, not that you could change them all, but, but you can say something in the right way to kind of make change, and, and that's what I hope to do this year. Um, you know, it's just, like I said, an honor to be able to come up and speak, but it's also an honor to be able to be called a teacher. Um, you know, I wasn't the greatest student when I was in school, so, you know, I thought my teachers had no idea what they were saying, and they couldn't relate to me, and, and, I, and I'm sure there are a few kids in my classroom over the last 14 years that have thought the same thing about me, and I think that's our hardest struggle is how do we get kids, or how do we relate to kids being, you know, 20, sometimes 30, sometimes 40, maybe even five years older than them, like, you know, they know a lot more than we do, and sometimes they do. And we have to kind of find them and, and pull that person out of them and share that person with us so we can be on the same page. And, you know, that's all I hope to do from this point on in the classroom. So thank you for letting me speak today. So the Wasmus Center would not accomplish half of what it does without the expertise and passion and the hard work of its staff. I'd like to thank Dan Prinzing, our executive director, and the center's staff for their profound contribution in helping us reach the critical and inspirational benchmark that we're at today. Through them, we've had 15 successful years of creating and implementing educational programs about human rights for Idaho students of all ages. So a round of applause for the staff. It's probably working somewhere and can't hear it. Dan Printing has expertise in curriculum and instruction, including a PhD in educational administration. Da Dan combines his extensive knowledge with a vigorous work ethic and a creative, progressive approach to teaching human rights. Under his leadership, we make the best possible use of this memorial and all it stands for. Dan is key to our efforts to teach, to inspire, and to encourage people to stand up to those who would discriminate. I'll call Dan to share a few thoughts about the future of the Wasson Center. Thank you, Sarah. And thank you all for joining us today for this important milestone. We stand here today celebrating a vision that a group of community leaders, human rights advocates, and citizens throughout the state and country work tirelessly to bring to life. For 15 years, the memorial has stood to represent our shared values. For 15 years, the memorial has welcomed K-12 students, university undergraduates, and adult community members on docent-led tours. For 15 years, the center has dedicated its efforts to take the memorial's message into classrooms and communities throughout the state. Today, we are celebrating the memorial's 15-year history, but our story has not been fully written. It is the next chapter, the next 15 years, that will define who and what we are. After this weekend's horrific open declaration of hate in Charlottesville, we received a comment on one of the center's Facebook posts. It said simply, why do I feel like I need to go stand next to Anne Frank and protect her? Well, Esteban, let me answer that by sharing from a poignant piece that one of the center's project partners Dr. Alan Kennedy from Hamlin University in Minnesota wrote that Anne Frank is still hiding. She is hiding in our Muslim brothers and sisters. She is hiding in the LGBTQ community, and she is hiding from the racist and anti-Semitic taunts that paraded in the street. She is hiding because she fears that those in power do not recognize, as it is written in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, that all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. So what does the future hold for the Wasmus Center and the Anne Frank Human Rights Memorial? As we promised in response to the vandalism last May, 
the memorial's message will not shrink. We have been empowered and emboldened to proclaim louder and clearer that Idaho is too great for hate. And as Jimmy Fallon so eloquently shared Monday night, ignoring hate is just as bad as supporting it. In the months to come, each time you visit the memorial, you will discover a piece has changed. A piece has been repaired or replaced, and the expansion has begun. You will discover that the WASMA Center's programmatic in footprint in the memorial is sharing a commitment to human rights that encourages each of us to learn from the horrors of the past, to guide our behavior and shape our attitudes in the future. Esteban, we will bring Anne Frank out of hiding. And in the powers of a divine universe, we will speak not out of political correctness, but from a commitment to moral correctness. We read the words etched in the stone, what you do not want done to yourself, do not do to others. The others. We will give Anne Frank, wherever and within whomever she is hiding, a voice and a face. The others who have been marginalized and targeted in the spiral of injustice will discover that the upstanders, those who recognize a wrong, will take action to make it right. Anne Frank will find Esteban standing there, standing up to protect her. And Esteban, you will find that you are not alone. We will use the power of technology, both in the memorial and with our electronic classroom, to share resources and content with the multimedia tools necessary to tell the story of human rights in a more engaging way. We will confront incivility by promoting human rights. And as Bill Wasmuth declared, saying yes to human rights is the best way to say no to prejudice. We will build upon the work that Marilyn Schuler began and share the triumphs and tragedies in the history of human rights in Idaho. The stories of refugees, people with disabilities, the LGBTQ community, Native Americans, African Americans, Latinos, Basque, Chinese, Japanese, Mormons, Jews, women, a shared story of facing and confronting injustice. In closing, I'd like to share a comment from a meeting I had just yesterday with a young father. He mused, wouldn't it be nice if the center's work wasn't necessary? I replied, wouldn't it be nice if the memorial were just a beautiful park? But we knew as we parted the conversation, our work is not done. Anne Frank dreamed, I want to go on living even after my death. Well, Anne, you live in Boise. Esteban, thank you for standing next to her. And for all of you, thank you for standing with the WASMA Center as we write the next chapter. Thank you, Dan. You see how we can create such good content for our education with Dan and at the head of our organization. All right, since its public dedication in 2002, the Idaho Anne Frank Human Rights Memorial has always been viewed as a classroom in which we draw upon the lessons in the quotes and that shapes our actions for the future. Today, we're gonna break ground on the final piece of construction in the memorial, an actual outdoor classroom with a roof covering for shade, permanent seating, and the integration of technology. It will be a classroom dedicated to teaching and learning about human rights in Idaho. It will be a classroom built in honor of one who dedicated her life to the promotion and protection of human rights. The Marilyn Schuler Classroom for Human Rights has been made possible because of some generous support from countless individuals 
businesses, and foundations. We are so grateful to the Greg Carr Foundation for issuing both a pledge and a challenge for funding to build a classroom. We also thank Dina Gray for matching Mr. Carr's challenge and giving so generously. And we're grateful to all of you who recognize, as Anne wrote, how lovely to think that no one need wait a moment. We can start now, start slowly changing the world. That one gives me shivers. <laughs> I would ask that each of the speakers today join me behind the log cabin. Dina Gray, please join us as well for a ceremonial groundbreaking. I want to thank you again for attending this important event and supporting human rights across the valley in our state and beyond. So thank you and good afternoon.